Real estate investing can bring big reward and big risks. So know your risks. Welcome to the Real Estate Risk Report, the show for real world insight on real estate investment risk. Now, here's your host, Lance Peterson. Welcome to the Real Estate Risk Report. Today I have with me Mike Zlotnick with uh, TF Management Group. So I've you know, I've known Mike for, for, for years now. He's been a longtime client of ours. We've been administering uh, his funds. We helped consult and advise on his funds. And um, so we've, we've seen, you know, much of the, uh, the growth they've experienced, you know, over time in, in their business. And, uh, you know, I think that as we get into this, you, you know, you'll find that, you know, Mike is, is, is very academic in his approach. He's, he, he understands you know, world economies and, you know, and all sorts of things. He's a trained mathematician. Uh, so very analytical approach into his, his investing. You can't get through a conversation with Mike without talking about risk. So I think he's a, is a great guy to have as a guest on the show. So, so Mike, why don't you share a little bit with us sort of, you know, um, you know, where you've come from, you know, how you got into this, this investing in, in general and, and, um, uh, yeah, just kind of start there and introduce yourself to the to the audience. Thank you, Lance. Kindly, uh, it's been a great journey uh, working with you and, and Matt and Darius and the whole Fairway and, and uh, very best team over the years. So I I, um, I live in Brooklyn, New York. Um, married for twenty one years, uh, four kids and a cat, the fifth child, and. Um, Originally, I'm the former from the former Soviet Union. I immigrated in 1989, a long time ago. I'm a U.S. citizen, obviously, U.S. patriot and, and all that stuff. Uh, I spent almost 15 years uh, in software uh, from uh, mid-90s until um, uh, 2009. I had a career. Uh, one of the companies I worked for, you guys are using Interlinks. So I spent six and a half years at Interlinks. So I, I have technology background and... Uh, uh, but I, I, I found that investing in real estate is what I enjoy the most. So I started investing in 2000, um, mostly in New York, buying apartments here, uh, some houses, and, and um, uh, some I flipped, some I kept, and <laughs> now I regret selling everything that I sold because everything has appreciated so much. So I'm happy to keep what I what I what I keep what I kept. But um, and then I. Uh, uh, in 2009, I went real estate full time. I was burned out from a software industry. Um, again, there's nothing wrong with software industry, as you know. You 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 spend years in that too. It, it can be fun and it can be great, uh, but if you like real estate, it's your passion. Uh, you want to do what you like to do, rather than when you're burned out, you have many teams to you know manage. So, long story short, 2009, I I went real estate full time and. Um, uh, been fund managers since uh, we have multiple generations of the funds uh, as the, the two flagship funds today is a tempo growth fund uh, it's a growth focus fund and again thank you for uh, fairway and Ve and very best uh, to help us set up and then tempo opportunity fund uh, these are our latest and greatest funds and uh, we've been growing AUM in these funds making investments um, into many commercial deals and um, so that, that's the long story yeah. So, so, you know, I know for you, you've, you've sort of developed this four quadrant system, you know, for how you, you know, really it, 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 it comes down to kind of how you look at the various, um, you know, income growth, you know, sort of this, uh, spectrum and, and, and ultimately that helps aid you in the creation of, of, of what amount to diversified portfolios of, of commercial real estate and, uh, real estate investments. So maybe share a little bit with us sort of, how you how you look at the, you know the world of investing you know which is you know oftentimes you're in sort of the, the role of the the you know the super investor who's you know very sophisticated who's looking at you know other people's opportunities and and, and figuring out you know whether it's a good deal or not sure so Robert Kiyosaki has his four quadrants. If you read Rich Dad Poor Dad, everybody's read that book. So <laughs> I have my four quadrants. They're different, but they're pretty straightforward. It's a methodology that has come. It's an educational methodology, sort of a fund manager's methodology, fairly straightforward. So imagine four quadrants. The top two are called, I call them investment grade, and then the bottom two are called speculative grade. And then imagine on the left side, you have a cash flow focus quadrants, one and three. And then... Uh, 
the two and four are your growth quadrants. So uh, having that basic um, map allows me and, and, and other folks who follow this methodology to look at any deal and see how it fits in. Uh, so if, if as a fund manager, I'm looking for growth deals and I'm looking for downside protection or more conservative deals, uh, it's a quadrant two deals. And um, as deals come in, and uh, they have good value at component, um, and they, they have limited cash flow from day one, but they have pretty good downside protection. So example of downside protection, obviously it varies, but uh, distressed commercial debt, first lien position at low investment to value ratio. It's not cash flowing, but it's got uh, good uh, investment to value or LTV. Uh, or uh, value at syndication with very moderate leverage, uh, that doesn't feel overloaded, and it's got enough reserves uh, to uh, deal through the value at part of the project. Uh, but it's not cash flowing from the, from day one. That's a what I call them investment grade and a growth type of project. Mm -hmm. The most common is a quadrant one. We say I started with quadrant two here just to give you an example of what it looks like. The quadrant one is another investment grade quadrant, uh, and that quadrant is income and downside protection. So what is that? Well, the first thing comes to mind is performing paper, low investment to value ratio, um, performance, obviously, that's that's a performing asset. Uh, value add syndication, um, sorry, a performing syndication, light value add, good cash flow. So imagine that you had downside protection co comes from good debt service coverage ratio, um, good reserves, experienced operator, and very moderate uh, value add. That way, you're not taking a lot of risk. So these type of uh, projects fall into these investment grade quadrants. Uh, there are a lot more speculative uh, deals than investment grade. So any kind of development, redevelopment, uh, land speculation, they're all quadrant four deals because they have no cash flow. They have a ton of risk associated with construction and redevelopment. And then, the, so those are quadrant four. And the final quick look on quadrant three, quadrant three is all about cash flow, but a higher leverage, a higher risk. So second lien loans fall into that quadrant. Highly leveraged deals fall into that quadrant. They can, they can cash flow, but because they are over leveraged, uh, there's an extra degree of risk. So those four quadrants provide basic framework at what I look at as an investor for our funds. Uh, as well as personally when looking at a deal. So for you, with when we talk about, you know, over leverage, you know, so what, what how do you determine whether a deal is over levered? You know, how, how do you, how do you kind of make that assessment or that judgment? It's probably the most, the greatest question of all that I've heard. What's the right leverage? Because there's no straight answer. Um, so if you are a lender, and you are in a first lien position, you, you certainly want to stay a, a, as low risk as possible. Uh, specifically, uh, if, if you can be at the LTV below 60%, uh, it feels pretty good in most of the projects. Can you go up to higher, 65, 70? Absolutely, you can. Uh, but it increases somewhat of a risk and obviously has to be compensated. On the commercial, on the equity side, when you are taking uh, leverage, uh, so it's a, if it's a performing project, I like DSCR above one, one and a half. I mean, there's no right or wrong answer, but strong DSCR helps. The other key question is how much leverage is too much leverage is what is the uh, predictability and stability of the uh, rents of the, of the income. So if it's a high quality commercial tenant uh, with a great uh, lease, that is a, um, a phenomenal um uh, uh, safety of the of the income. If the income is, if your tenant base is such that you you, you have a lot of risk associated with tenant base, high leverage can can burn the project if you lose a couple of tenants. So it's not just the uh, the the leverage itself, but what is the quality of the underlying um, income? So if you could if you can build a confidence there, then you can take a higher leverage. So debt service coverage ratio is critically important. Now, in many commercial deals, DSCR of 1.2 or one, one and a quarter is very common, but it comes down to having uh, reserves, um, extra reserves, and and and, and um, confidence in the uh, in the income. So on a value add projects, uh, you could justify higher leverage too because they're increasing the future cash flows. So value add depends on what type of an asset, but let's just say multifamily. Mm -hmm. uh, if they're renovating units and increasing rents, 
and you're taking um, into the account the future value and the future cash flows, you could take um, a little bit higher leverage. Uh, so, under seventy. And that's mainly your, when you say that it's it's also because there's sort of this forced appreciation as you push rents as you do those things the value the V and LTV is is in, is going up and therefore keeping that the loan amount in 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 check is that kind of how you look at it yeah exactly so you could you could do going in low. Um, loan to cost could be 85%, for example, which feels like high leverage in general. But if you go loan to the future value and it's 70%, then it's a very different beast. So it's very, it's very common and typical on value add projects, rehabs and you know, fix and flip projects. We obviously do that. So we'll go to 70% of the future value and that's fairly, you know, fairly comfortable. So there's no right or wrong. It obviously depends also on the, on the asset class. Um, so multifamily is fairly straightforward. Now, if you're dealing with some of these volatile asset classes today, like, like shopping retail, that, that is, as you know, uh, has been very, um, a very stressed sector due to COVID. So 60% leverage is probably maximum leverage that most of the banks will allow because uh, the, 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 the tenant quality is a, uh, and, and, and certainty and the rents is highly uncertain now. It's, it's, it's the reverse of uh, predictable uh, rent. It can fall apart. We're going to have a second wave. So depending on the sector, um, the leverage has to, has to come down. It, it, it is related to level of confidence that uh, that sector will perform in the future. Uh, obviously, hotels is, is a huge ris- risk factor today. And uh, we've invested a number number of projects uh, sponsored by Fairway with uh, higher leverage where there is redevelopment of a hotel. Is that wrong? Absolutely not. If you're converting from hotel to affordable housing and affordable housing um, is a strong demand, I mean, we could take a little more leverage. Yeah. So the, so for, for you, you know, there's, you know, you have the whole notion of in theory, you know, these days with the sort of jobs act, you know, many people can go direct you know, into individual projects, you know, on their own, um, you know, what would you tell someone that's sort of trying to assess whether or not to go into a fund, you know, where there's a manager like yourself, who's basically building a diversified portfolio versus them, you know, I guess, DIYing it and, and building, you know, or, and attempting to build their own. Sure. So it, it's all of the above. There's nothing wrong with uh, building a portfolio yourself, and there's nothing wrong uh, 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 by going through a fund like ours. So we provide two primary benefits uh, on a fund level. One is diversification. So you write one check into a portfolio of many assets. So instantly you, you get that benefit. Two, it's a higher access point. So many of the deals we invest in, we get into class A units versus a class B. If they wanted to get into class A, they have to write a million dollar check. But if they don't write a million dollar check, they're class B. So there's a little bit of that elevation. Um, in, in addition to that, there, there are many deals that are not available to broad public. Uh, they're smaller deals or they're deals that are just, the capital is raised through a private network, including some of the relationships we have with you and other sponsors. They just, there's no marketing, there's no direct advertisement. Uh, so we, we get into these deals and we will often negotiate a side letter. So what's, what's most interesting is we, we've had deals where we uh, were the first or the last drop in the bucket. So by being first on the last drop in the bucket, the sponsor is willing to um, uh, sign improved terms. We have one deal where the, the general pref was 10% through a side letter it was 24, as crazy as it sounds. Yeah. Because there, there was a last drop in the bucket and they need to close and they were willing to do it uh, as it has marginal um, value to them without that money at the last moment, it just can't function. So that's, that's, that's back to the elevation point and um, higher access point to the same deals. Also concentration. So if you write a check, so you give you an example. Um, someone can write a hundred thousand dollar check into a deal and a hundred thousand dollar check into a fund that invests in the same deal. Let's just say at a, at a class A units, but better, better terms. The exposure to the deal will be smaller. So they could take concentrated bets, concentrated risk by writing direct checks into specific deals. At the same time, they, they take general diversification approach through a fund like ours. Does that make sense? Yeah, no, it makes perfect sense. I mean, so, 
yeah, I mean, I think that that, yeah, that makes a lot of sense. It's just, it's, and if that particular, if they decide to go highly concentrated, 100 grand into one deal, if that deal goes sideways, you know, it's going to really hurt. Whereas if they had exposure to the same deal through a portfolio, you know, the, the impact and effect that they would feel would be much more nominal. Yeah, it's exactly the case. Uh, COVID uh, has brought this to uh, acute attention. Uh, those investors who had significant positions in hospitality, they took it on the chin in a big way. Retail, some, you know, some serious punch too. So uh, having, uh, and what's what's most fascinating is you just don't know when the next black swan is going to appear and what it's going to look like. It could be a sector of the economy, or it could be a region. It could be a specific operator or a sponsor, right? So you have these risks. I call them the dimensions of diversification. You just never know what's going to do great and what's going to fall apart. Again, a great sponsor could get hit by a bus. And he's a great leader of a team, and the team may not be able to do as well as th- that great leader. Uh, it could be a regional thing. I mean, we're talking about some could happen in a given region. Uh, could be local political issues. Or could be, God forbid, some kind of you know um, accident or some kind of event. You know, you just never know. It could be a massive hurricane that could take down uh, even a city or a town. It, it it can. So that's all these things matter, and that's why diversification. You can almost you you can never go wrong in diversification. There's an interesting theory I learned a long time ago, and not a theory, but a statement. Um, some of these uh, so-called experts uh, teach you, well, diversification is for the people who can't invest themselves. They have no clue what to do it. They can't you know, make decisions. That's why they diversify. And there's logic to this. But on the other side of the spectrum is even as a fund manager, even when we can make educated decisions that we have great deals, we still can't overload the portfolio. The other thing that I do, and I think I've showed you this for Tempo Grow Fund, we have a blueprint for the fund. So we're not just building the fund, deals come across, and hopefully the good deals will plug them in. No, we have a blueprint to build diversification among many dimensions. So as you know, it's a $25 million fund, and we basically have rules uh, of diversification in the fund. So we have our sweet spot, half a million to a million that we write. Uh, we want to get 20 to 30 deals, which is just a basic framework. No sponsor, no, no deal should get more than 10%, um, period. And no, ex- no exposure to any subclass, like multifamily, self-storage, uh, conversions of hotels, uh, industrial should take more than 20% of the fund. So having these basic rules and building uh, kind of a house with a blueprint or a fund with a bl- blueprint helps build a, um, a diversified vehicle. And there are many risk mitigation strategies, but diversification is probably number one in my view. Mm-hmm. And then when, when you are assessing a given, you know, a given deal or an opportunity, um, you know, what, what is the, what is sort of your number one red flag or the thing that, that, that you know, what, what is the first thing when someone, when someone, I mean, I'm assuming lots of guys are putting deals in front of you knowing, you know, kind of your position in the market, you know, what, what is sort of that number one thing that maybe disqualifies a lot of the deals, you know, that when you're looking at them or maybe the things that, you know, the red flags that you're looking for? I'm just curious, sort of like your screening and vetting process and diligence process, you know, what, what does that common sort of DQ uh, look like? So we'll start, again, great question. We'll always start with the, um, with the sponsor, with the person, the team. Right. So number one, it comes people, and and we were looking for uh, lack of integrity. Even you know, on the on the good side, you want to see integrity. On the bad side, if there's lack of integrity. If they say something and it's different, that's right away. Mm-hmm. Uh, so they don't do what they say. Uh, second thing is you ask for information. It takes them a long time to deliver. It's some just not prepared. Right. And those are pretty basic steps. Uh, three, the two smooth. As crazy as it sounds, I don't want to have smooth people. I want to have I want to have real people. So as you see, they everything that they delivering, everything is just super pretty, so well designed. You ask for information, they give you the entire deal room. Everything is perfect. They've designed the whole thing, and yeah, it, it happens. You can have a well designed but um, marketing materials, but too perfect is 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 not right either. Uh, so again, referral. It, it, it can't understate um, uh, the referral chain. So if we get a new deal and it's coming on a strong referral, 
question becomes what they've done in the past. How has your experience been with them? And uh, it very, it, it, and also, how do they handle the basic uh, questions about the performance? What deals have you done? How, how, how do they look like? And, and somebody says, well, everything has been perfect. Everything has gone smoothly. That's a problem. That, 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 that doesn't happen in the real world. So we're looking for sort of, um, I don't want to invest with brilliant marketers. I want to invest with real people who can actually explain. We, we understand how the business works, uh, how they make money, and how they've dealt with problems. So on a personal level or individual or on a sponsor uh, operator level, just kind of seeing what, what the organization looks like, how they answer questions, how they, they handle. It's the first, if we can't clear the, the people element, we can't look at the deals. It doesn't matter. The, the, the pattern will continue, and if they have problems with people in the past, the problems will continue with the new projects. Yeah. So it's people, and then we'll go into the project. The project is, is a little different. Uh, obviously, we, we got to look at the stress cases. Like, uh, one of the basic scenarios is you're projecting this value as strategy. What happens if it takes longer? What happens if you over overrun the, ca- the costs? And, um, um, you know, looking for cracks in the ice. It's, there's no perfect underwriting. Um, some of the deals we obviously invest with you guys, you guys do great underwriting when it's part of the of fairway team. But when we do our own deals, we engage third-party underwriters. Um, uh, it's kind of interesting, uh, a little different from what we, what we do from you do. You guys, you have staff underwriters. We'll go and we have connections through WeWorks and a number of other sites, these hired guns that have a day job somewhere in a bank and they got to make a buck additional hmm. So we've hired them at a one tenth of the price that, that, that a third party would, would charge for. Uh, and they do it privately. Um, and what's interesting is, is basically we just ask them, hey, here's a project. Um, here's the sponsor assumptions. Find problems with this. Hmm. And we find problems or at least questions. You, you ask the sponsor and then you start going through the conversation. And the good sponsors have a realistic view of the world. Uh, and those who have a very optimistic projections start uh, questioning the the questions. Oh, that's not that's the wrong question. That, so yeah. that's an immediate, you know, it, it gets back to the personality and it's back to they think they got it. And, and the, the real people will say, yeah, I mean, these are good questions. And uh, here's what we use on the assumptions. And here is our sensitivity study to cap rates or sensitivity study to different NOI levels. And uh, if they can answer those questions and say, hey, the return might wind up being instead of 20% projected on the pro forma, but only 12, but this is a very conservative scenario. We can show you why, right? And mm-hmm. so questions like that. Yeah, so you're, you're not, so for, I mean, and, and not that I'd expect you to, but it, it, it seems as though many investors who might not be as savvy or experienced oftentimes chase after those sort of guys who are using these, you know, these very overly optimistic sort of pro formas and view of the world and, you know, 23, you know, it just seems that you can't get an email these days on one of these deals without, you know, the IRR, you know, 23.6 IRR in the subject line of the email. Um, So clearly it must be working and I'm not surprised, but, you know, what what would you say to people that kind of view it that way that just kind of stop at, well, that's a 2.76 equity multiple with a crazy IRR. <laughs> so, yeah, that, that's a great, great, great point. And um, uh, not to go far, I think yesterday or the day before yesterday, I saw a deal that came through my email and it had 67% IRR, something like that. I looked at it like I, I had to read it twice. So uh, there are a lot of optimistic deals in the 20s and, and, and here's a deal that has uh, obscenely higher IRR. And, and I'm not questioning it. It's not an impossible situation. There may be some special circumstances, but these deals with that kind of IRR, they don't need to send it to investors through email. If, right. they ha- if they anybody uh, out there, they have friends, they have history of investors, they, that deal will fly off the shelf to friends and family. Mm-hmm. So that's the kind of the rule number one. The stuff that gets promoted, not necessarily bad, but it just it, it, it's the stuff that needs the promotion. So that's that's on the extreme side. If it looks too good to be true, it is. There's a reason for this. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then you look at some of these, um, let's just say, legit deals with very optimistic projections, uh, because the uh, offering document is sort of a marketing uh, pitch deck. 
And 90% of the time, then the numbers will be pretty, pretty uh, optimistic. So um, if it's coming from a known source, from somebody who we've invested in the past, so we feel we, 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 we want to consider the deal. At that point, we start looking at the assumption. And uh, part of that quadrant methodology uh, is a real basic uh, adjustment for risk. So quadrant one and two generally have one or two percent risk adjustment. So whatever the, the methodology is, if it's a quadrant one or two, you still need to adjust the, the pro forma down by a couple percentage points. Uh, but if it's a quadrant three and four, it's immediately six, eight percent adjustment down. Mm. So whenever we see 22, 24 percent pro forma, right off the bat, I know it's, you got to write it down by six to eight percent before we even you know think about it any deeper. But it is, uh, it's a discussion on the assumption. The first thing I do is I ask them when they send me that, that offering deck is where's the underwriting spreadsheet? Where's the performance spreadsheet? Show me their freaking assumptions, pardon me. Mm -hmm. uh, and if they're not willing to do that, there's nothing to discuss. But it is looking into the mathematics, the first step before we could check uh, the underwriting due diligence, but just show me the key metrics, uh, occupancy rate. I mean, I've seen the other day I saw a project uh, office building, they're taking it down at 60% occupancy today. Apparently, you know, it's, it's, it's a prominent building in, in, in Florida mm -hmm. and a reputable group. I looked at the deal and they're starting with 60% occupancy. And then I looked the, at the exit occupancy and it's like 85. Is that realistic? And, and these type of assumptions, you can very quickly go through and question uh, IRR because on value add deals, three quarters of the return, if not more, comes on the back end. So if the assumptions are wrong, if your exit occupancy um, cannot be achieved or, so, or sustained or maintained, your IRR is, disappears. Yeah. So, yeah, exactly. Yeah, because that's where it's all it's all baked in. And yeah, and like you said too, it's just, it's it's all, I mean, IRR is, 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 uh, you know, it's it's a kind of a flawed thing to to begin with, in that it, it's you know especially with the projection because it's it's a it's a time weighted it's a time weighted return, so right like it, it's just if everything if they're if they basically push it up and say they're going to sell it for that in three years you know that's a far different IRR than if it sells six years later, right? I mean time kills IRR, and. Um, you know, and it, it, it is what it is, but yeah, I think it's like looking beyond it. I mean, it's, it's, it's a good way to, and I think it's intentional you know, or the design up front was to basically be able to take multiple opportunities in front of you, you know, you know, where do I put my money if, you know, weighing one, you know, A versus option, you know, opportunity B, you know, what has the, you know, and you're playing it out and, but it, it all assumes that you beat the timelines up. I mean, everything does. It means that you've really, really thought hard about, every little assumption knowing that you're wrong no matter what because you don't know and you know but that unfortunately does seem that that's where you know these days just you know a, a multifamily syndication you know everyone feels this this it, it's sort of this dysfunctional process that's uh, proliferated itself because everyone knows that investors which is why we're kind of doing this particular podcast is just to train people to look beyond those things you know don't fall prey to to, to, to this stuff and, and, you know, and, and just think that, well, I'm going to invest in this one because they said they're going to get a 20, you know, a 23.7 IRR. It's like, okay, it's just, that, that's not, that's not the right way to do it versus this guy who's, you know, projections are probably much closer to reality, you know, that, you know, saying he's going to generate a 16.4, you know, or, or something like that. It's, it's, it's learning those skills to, to dig in to those layers below that as to how you got it. Um, you know, and of course it does start with, I've got a lot of people like, you know, explain to me how IRR works. And I'm like, okay, type in IRR into Google. Okay. And then click on the Wikipedia article and go find the formula for IRR. Right. So it's like, it's crazy. So it's like, see, th that's the complexity that you're talking about. It's, it's not about that. It's about now go to Excel, open Excel, and type in date that you're going to put the money out, date you expect it to get back, right? The negative amount for the money you put in, you know, and, and, you know, whatever, and, and start to do it and run an XIR function. But now start flipping the dates and start flipping when the, and anyone can do that. Anyone who's got Microsoft Excel or, you know, Google Sheets can do that. 
And it's that's how you learn why it's so important to go and look at what they say they're going to do, you know, and wh- how are they going to pay you this? You know, where's this cash flow going to come from? Right. Like you're like you're saying it's a, it's a deep value add play. Like, how are they going to you know, is it realistic that they're going to generate these kind of cash flows? Not to mention, you know, are those cash flows going to end up in your pocket? Those are two different things. Right. It's, it might be one thing the project generates it, but are they going to be able to distribute it to your point about the reserves? Right. Like if there's not enough reserves then they're going to have to hang on to that cash. Right. That's right. So just a couple of other final thoughts. So exactly. I agree with you. Um, the, a lot of people suffer from the shiny object syndrome. So the higher IRI is a shiny object. Uh, so you, you have to be extremely careful not to be it, it, it catches initial attention. And then if you don't dig, dig through properly, uh, you're sold purely on a stick of price. So you don't know what's behind the wheels. Uh, but on the looking at the return perspective, I think the most important thing is not just the IRR, but also look what portion that IRR comes in cash and when. Like that's, I mean, effectively IRR function in, in Excel, I use XIRR, yeah, to yeah. plug in the dates and distributions. Just look at uh, the cash flow projections. And, and how realistic they are. And if, if a significant portion of IRR comes in the form of cash, that, that's very helpful. I mean, these yeah. are generally more income-focused projects. But on a growth projects, uh, I, I really like to play around with the key assumptions. So if, if, if it's a growth project, uh, what happens when a cap rate uh, is a little off? And the good news, the good news, uh, COVID did one thing, like, that's really great. COVID did a lot of bad things. It hurt a lot of people. A lot of people died. But it did one great thing for real estate. It, it, took, it forced Fed to cut rates. So rates, uh, rate cut is great for cap rates. In general, uh, there is a long-term correlation between interest rate and cap rates. If interest rates go down, the cap rates go down. So the projects underwritten today at a cap rate of six, where they were underwritten pre-COVID at a cap rate of six, when the interest rates were where where they, they they were pre-COVID, and now they're lower, it's it's very plausible that over time as things stabilize, then the cap rates will drop on the same asset to five and a half to five and a quarter, and that change over half a half a percent can gr- greatly benefit the the return for obvious reasons. Yeah. So. Uh, uh, it, it is a side side effect of, of COVID, but I think we, we're here, uh, the low interest rates are here to stay. I mean, I, I follow the, the basic theory that we are moving towards Japan model, very low interest rates going into negative. So the cap rates are likely going to stay low. Um, can they drop a little more? They, they may. But part of the review of a project is to look at what exit cap rate uh, they're using and if it, and what is sensitivity to cap rates and also NOI. It's one thing that we have seen with a number of projects recently. The NOI projections could, could fail for whatever reasons. Um, for one, COVID is creating difficult situations with evictions, and the rent increases may be slower than projected, even though the affordable housing sector is, sounds good and, and general multifamily, people need to live somewhere. Uh, but ability to push rents is an int- is an important function, and if it doesn't work out, it doesn't work out. It's a very sector specific thing. Look at self storage; it's another great um, a- asset class that I that I like. But self storage has one significant upside and downside. When the occupancy high, you can push the rents up. When, when, when the occupancy is not there, you have to discount and you have to bring in. Uh, the, the tenants at all costs to, to build up occupancy mm-hmm. and, uh, and leases a month to month. So it's a fascinating asset class. It's a great asset class, but the future value could be a function if, if the market conditions somewhat change and competition pops up, the rents are not what you projected. Suddenly the value is not what you projected. Yeah. So very, very sensitive to the asset class. So now, especially now I'm paying a lot of attention to self storage because of that functionality of that asset class, it's a month to month. And, and if you got a great asset and, and just another one pops out across the street from your asset for some reason, then you could be impacted. So it's kind of, um, yeah, it's true. It's true. I mean, self storage does have, I mean, as far as, I mean, real estate typically isn't a very volatile asset class, but as far as self storage as a property type, 
it, it, it's, it definitely is far more volatile for, like you said, those supply and demand, you know, issues. And then like you said, the fact that the short lease times, you know, month to month, someone comes across the street, the long time it takes to, you know, the uh, absorption rates are, you know, it, it's are lower, you know, but it's, it doesn't mean it's bad, but it just means that those are the things that you need to be thinking about that once again, just because some guy, you know, kicked out some, fancy looking complicated spreadsheet doesn't mean that that that's what's going to happen. Right. And so it always goes back. I mean, I feel like, you know, to wrap this up today, right. It's just as always, and this is why, you know, from the, the you know, you know, the, the very best side of things that we're doing is that it's just, it's, it's, it's sponsor driven, right. It's the same thing you said. It starts with the sponsor, the sponsor of high quality, Right. And then for them, when they decide to make an investment that you're participating in, it's all about getting in at the right basis and then being realistic about what is going to happen, knowing that that the future is always uncertain. It might be more uncertain than now than it has been. But no matter what, every day, every moment in front of us is is an uncertainty. We, we don't know what's going to happen. And that's what ultimately is called risk. It's it's you can't avoid it. I mean, it's it's that's what it is. It's a risk. Any decision you make has risk involved in it. That's right. And one more comment. And again, I appreciate the great service you do at Verivest. I mean, this is the reason we love working with you. And you, you, you vet sponsors, which is probably the number one function, as you said, is to vet the people um, first. If you, if you, I like to use these words. You have to know, like, and trust. Yeah. The sponsor, fund manager, operator, syndicator, whoever. You, if you if you don't start there, you can't go further. But another critical point and, and a point is that you really have to pay attention to the deal dynamics in a waterfall. And um, uh, I know mem- uh, all the fairway funds and a lot of the de- the guys that you put on the platform, they have institutional or professional level waterfalls with a good pref and an 80-20 split above that or 70-30. But there are a lot of comedians out there. What, what boggles my mind, people will, will put up a ground up self-storage and they'll they'll do eight pref and then fifty fifty over over eight, and somehow they still have IRR at twenty five percent to investors. Well, it's almost mind boggling. How do you get there? It's just all game of numbers. So the waterfall, the non professional waterfall, and the fees that the sponsors collect, are as as important um, as the IRR itself. If it's a fair split, if the if the deal or a fund or a syndication has the right waterfall, cumulative PREF, uh, 70-30 or 80-20 in favor of investors, uh, at least you're getting as an investor a, a better, a, a good part of the bargain, not not a crappy part of the bargain. So many comedians literally had a call with a good friend just now, really sharp cat in my, in my collective genius mastermind, and they're doing a multifamily deal, uh, and, and they've been doing this for a while, they're specialists. And what they do is they pay 6% PREF, and then they do 50-50 split above six until 12, and they chop you off. You're done. Your cap is 12. People still invest with them. It's, it's, it's almost amazing how they can bring these very crappy deals, very great guys, but the terms are so bad. Uh, yes, you'll make it 12% when things are going well, but when the deal with things go wrong, you'll lose your whole shirt, and, and people still invest with them. It's amazing. It's fascinating. Right, there's no equity behind them. They're in first loss position. On the on the deal, and you're just saying it's it's basically it's they're getting pref equity like terms for being common equity. Exactly. So it's it's the right word. The right word is risk adjusted return, uh, and majority of the investors don't understand the risk. They all they understand is return, and, and, and that's that's the probably number one flaw uh, in investing is that. The return, especially on the pro forma, is a shiny object, and people take it for granted. And two, they don't adjust for risk. And some of these deals have such massive level of risk that if you do risk adjusted, you could be a negative return number. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, you. Yeah, you. They, they, yeah, that that makes sense. I mean, so you said, you know, when you talk about sort of a professional waterfall, is it? And by that, do you mean? that short of whatever fees have been disclosed, you know, some asset management fee or fund management fee or whatever, is that the investor had their downside risk is protected through some sort of that, that preferred return or hurdle ensures they get a hundred percent of that until you do. I mean, is that what you mean by like, and then the fact that, that they share that there's at minimum, there's, they're sharing all the way up, not where you're cut off. I mean, there's some guys structured deal where they're basically getting, 
some percentage ownership of the partnership and, and sharing in the profits independent of whether they perform? I mean, would that be, I mean, what's the alternative to, what's the alternative to a waterfall? Just a straight joint venture structure where you just, you know, I, I don't, I don't even understand what the alternative would be. So give you some examples. Let's start with basics. So we look at the deal, start looking at alignment of interest. Uh, is, is the sponsor operator getting ton of fees up front? So you, you see asset acquisition fee, development fees, and all that st- stuff. If, if, if heavy fees flow to the developer, um, regardless of the waterfall, they just get paid, the acquisition fee and then the development yeah. fee and everything else. Those fees get paid to, to the uh, uh, operator or sponsor and, and before a dollar of the return, <laughs> how much is it in relation to the project? How typical it is? Uh, absolutely pay attention to that. So a small asset acquisition fee, 1%, one5 is fine, but I've seen 6 7 8%. It's too heavy. Mm-hmm. Uh, the alignment of interest is not there. They get paid regardless of what happens. Second thing is uh, there are deals with a PREF and some deals without the PREF. So we absolutely have seen that th- those deals where they carry the interest and the sponsor, uh, let's just say, they raise 100% of the capital and they give investors um, 80% of the profit share. So there's, an, there's no profit, it's an 80-20 from day one. Okay. Is that horrible? Not necessarily. If the fees are moderate, uh, it helps to have a PREF. The PREF is absolutely critical on growth deals because you just don't know what's going to happen. So on a growth deal, PREF makes a big difference. On an income deal, 80-20 uh, split without a PREF is absolutely fine if, they're, you know, if the numbers work. Um, so it's a combination of fees as much as you can alignment, uh, but I do worry, as part of not worry, but I consider something really important. The sponsor has to be motivated. So the sponsor has to eat. If I like the sponsor and they do a good job, uh, as much as I worry to maximize the return for, for us, uh, for our funds, I also want to make sure the, fund, the, sponsor, the sponsor is collecting fair and reasonable fees. And I, we could push on them a little bit on the negotiation. The moment it gets out of whack, and then you got to push back. But if the fees are reasonable and it helps them stay motivated through, throughout, throughout the life of the project, mm-hmm. it, it makes a ton of sense. So what's a good waterfall? There is no right or wrong. I, I like the, I learned this from Matt, right? From Matt Burke, uh, that the institutional professional level waterfalls are uh, much easier to sell to people who understand. People who don't understand, you can sell them anything you want, right? Anything you put in front of them, they'll click the invest button. But generally, like most of your funds have a PREF, um, there's no right or wrong number, seven, eight percent profit, and that's what we have too. And a waterfall in class A units, when people write your sizable check, have an 80 20. I mean, Tempo Grove, it's a, it's, it's eight profit and 80 20 over eight for class A units and 70 30 for class B. Yeah. Uh, I think it's reasonable. And um, uh, so they, I, I wish there was a single simple answer. Also, it really, it really depends on how much work the sponsor does, how heavy lifting yeah. it is. Yeah. Yeah, no, I, I agree. I mean, those are all the things that, you know, for, for me, when I advise clients and on, you know, structure and architecture of these vehicles, I mean, ultimately, all the things you and I have talked about, you have to take into account, right? At the end of the day, the experience of the, you know, if, if you're, if you have less experience, then you're going to have to give up more, right? Why? Because the risk is higher, right? It's all about that. It's that it's just at the end of the day, like you got the project on its own, on its face, you know, what, what, you know, you have to do that assessment. What can it generate? And then how much of it is shared with those who put up the money is predicated on, because in all cases, it requires some amount of execution, right? I mean, unless it's a core deal that doesn't require you to do anything, but even then you got to maintain it, ensure that you remain competitive. And I mean, it's fluid. Like it, so if you don't know what you're doing, the, the risk goes up. It's not to say that you don't invest with someone who's, you know, just, you know, that's been an acquisitions guy and has gone on their own or whatever. It just means that, you, you should be compensated for that additional risk, which is a lack of experience. Um, and it's just taking all of those variables into account to, to do that. I mean, that's how I do it when I'm trying to help them figure out what is a fair structure. Like you said, what's a fair waterfall? Because, you know, you have to take all of those things into account. The more risk variables you insert in there, then you better make sure that whatever it is you're investing in can, you know, hit those, hit those marks. Because if you're doing some ground up deal, and, you know, you're not going to be able to generate, you know, a 20, 25, 30 IRR at the project level, then maybe it's not a deal worth doing, right? Because that, that risk is inherent. you got to come up out of the ground. you got all these different things. And, you know, and if you're willing to do that and, and you're telling me you can only deliver a 10, you know, a 10 gross 
return or your IRR or whatever, that means that that's a bad deal to do. You should never have done it to begin with. So yeah, it's, there is no right answer, but that's the whole point of this particular podcast is like, it's, there's more than meets the eye. Now, the good news is that this stuff is accessible. Most of this stuff is when you really get down to it, it's a lot of fancy terms like debt service coverage ratio and cap rates and whatever. But at the end of the day, it's a lot of it's just common sense. And, you know, and it's just understanding what all these different moving parts are and how to kind of evaluate them. Um, so, yeah, the, the, I have two, two quick comments. So thank you, Lance. So for, th thank you for doing this podcast. It is really important for the community uh, to educate people. Uh, hopefully most of the listeners are very sophisticated and they can understand uh, IRR and cap rates and everything else. And not only can they, 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 they build expertise mm -hmm. dissecting those numbers. Uh, but a couple of comments. One, uh, how, what's the easiest way to translate kind of IRR into the um, common terms? The way I like to think of the IRR is sort of um, compounded average annualized return. So IRR gets gets high if the cash comes out earlier, it, and if it doesn't come out, it's like a compounded effect. So if yeah. you have a deal, you invested a hundred grand, and you got out two hundred grand out of it in five years, the average annual return is twenty percent, but the IRR will look like. 16 and 15 in that range because of that compounding uh, way to, to, to run the math. Yeah. And then the, the final thought on the, um, uh, on the whole uh, deal selection perspective. So I probably should have started there. A lot of investors don't have that blueprint what they're trying to do. So uh, as we go through and underwrite all these deals and we find that it's a good deal, but does it fit into your portfolio? That's the real basic stuff. Uh, I, I know we're not spending a ton of time on this, but I wanted to kind of bring it up as um, you, you cannot underestimate putting the wrong deals into a portfolio. If you're looking for an income, yeah. you have a great shiny object deal and, it, yeah. and it, it, it promises you great IRR and you actually go through the diligence and you think it's a great deal. Yeah you have to take a step back. I mean, yeah. you know what I'm doing recently. As deal, deals come across, immediately I'm thinking, does it fit the Tempo Growth Fund for growth or does it fit Tempo Opportunity for income? Yeah. Although Tempo Opportunity is both income and growth, but we are focusing more on income today. Yeah. So that's as basic as it gets. Yeah. Too many people forget about that real basic re reason <laughs> to... Um, yeah, that's right. Yeah. That, Why are they investing? That, that Cabo development looks really pretty and cool and whatever, but it's like, man, you know, you need to, you need to invest that money into some income product because you just retired last week. You know, like it's, yeah. I mean, at the end of the day, yeah, I mean, we're, 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 we're going a little deeper than that, but yeah, it does start with like, that's what I tell all my clients. I just say, listen, right now I know that you want to buy real estate. I mean, ultimately that's what you're, 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 you're here and you want to buy more real estate. But for me, I'm saying, when you talk to me, we're trying to create a net new investment product that we're going to release to the market. It's like a product at the grocery store or whatever. It has to solve someone's problem, right? So it's like, we, we need to be mindful of what problem of theirs is this going to solve? Yeah, great. It solves your problem. You, you love buying real estate. That's what you love to do. But what problem does this solve of theirs? And we need to make sure that, that, that it does. Like, that's why you've got different funds. This is a growth fund. It solves those who are looking for growth. They don't need any more income, right? They might be a high wage earner or whatever their reason is, right? The other guys who, you know, don't have a bunch of income are looking for income. So it always starts there. And, you know, but I, I think too, like I said, my, mine is just to make this more accessible for, for anyone who has, you know, the, you know, at least the accredited investor sort of standards been met, you know, how, how do we help people, you know, get over that hump and, and not make it so scary. So I appreciate having you on, Mike. It's always good. Love, uh, love your insight. So um, take care and thanks for joining us. Thank you, Lance. Appreciate uh, your kind invitation. Wishing everyone um, stay well and safe. All right. Take care, Mike.